Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Monatui, coach of the Baltimore Orb Beatles, and today I'm bringing you guys APA Week 2 versus the Baltimore Corvinates, coached by Kelly, aka Under the Radar. Definitely check out his YouTube link, as well as the rest of the coaches in APA down in the description below. And just to preface this video, as you can see, we are not doing this live. Uh, we are actually on Kelly's YouTube channel, because my OBS wouldn't pick up the, uh, the file that he sent me of the match. So we're just going to be kind of post comming the over the live commentary of uh, his perspective of our game. If you would like to hear the live perspective of his and mine game, definitely go over to his channel and you'll see uh, he and I actually gathered in call just to you know, play in call, which was a lot of fun. Uh, he and I are good friends, so we were comfortable with it and it ended up being kind of fun. Minus a little bit of a spoiler alert we disconnected toward the end of this game but we're going to talk about a little bit later how it didn't really matter all that much regardless if you want to hear the live commentary definitely check out his channel but for the little post commentary that we're doing over here uh stick around and we'll go into the game and how it went so if you did not watch my team builder we have a physically defensive sanaconda with glare and rocks adamant life orb dracozolt with sand rush we have assault vest hitmonchan special defensive assault vest gigalith and then we have our Choice Scarf Reboot and our Choice Scarf Haunter, both of which are very threatening versus his team. As you can see, Kelly did not bring his Dark type, so he has absolutely no Ghost Resist, which is really nice. He also does not have a Fire Resist outside of the Charizard, which does not want to switch in on a Flare Blitz from Reboot, which is really nice. Um, Sandaconda is also kind of nice versus his team. Like He has the, obviously the Golurk and the Cabalion, which I can deal with decently well. Uh, and Dracosult has the potential to run a train on his team. Obviously, he has the Kyrium, which takes a lot of damage from Dragon Claw. And then we have Bolt Beak for the Charizard and the Cabalion. Uh, and then Dragon Claw for the other three members of his team. Even, I think, Bolt Beak actually does more than Dragon Claw to uh, resist, which is kind of funny. But depending on his team, Dracosult can absolutely run a train through. Like, with the Sand Up, Venusaur is going to not be able to have good synthesis recovery, which is going to be really nice. His ground type has no recovery. Vikavolt might have recovery, but then it's kind of limited on its moves. So, the game plan, kind of whittle his uh, checks away to Dracosult and then run a train through his team. Gigalith is also fantastic. He brought several special attackers that Gigalith handles very, very well. He handles the Kyrim and the Charizard very, very well, as well as potentially the Vikavolt. Obviously, Kyrim could be physical, and even Charizard could be phys could be physical, but hopefully we will just be facing these special variants. So, without further ado, let's hop into the game real quick. We're just going to skip ahead to the cards right here, or a little bit after the cards. So, uh, by the way, obviously because um, I'm looking at his channel, you're going to see my plays from his perspective. But I led with my Reboot because it had a good overall matchup versus his team. If he led with either of his Hazard Setters in uh, Cobalion or Vikavolt to get up either Rocks or Webs, it was a very good matchup. And if he decided to lead with the Venusaur, obviously it worked out well for me. I can U-turn out versus anything I want. Uh, and obviously Golurk is not the best matchup for me, so I'm just going to go for the U-turn out, which is Stab, as you can see here, because of my Libero, which is legal in this league. Uh, we're going to get a decent little chip onto Golurk and then go right out into our Sandaconda, which is physically defensive and should be able to take on whatever this thing wants to do. Based on that U-turn damage, it looks like he is a little bit more offensive and is maybe running a little bit less uh, bulk than I had anticipated. I anticipated, him to, I anticipated him to be a little bit more physically defensive just because of Dracozolt being a huge threat, but he does have other potential checks to it, so it makes sense that he would want to run this a little bit more offensively, especially if I'm locked in the Bolt Beak or something along those lines. But as you can see here, he sets up the Rock Polish and then goes for an Earthquake on the following turn. I really don't have a problem with this because my Sandaconda is going to be able to take that hit pretty well and be able to dish out a little bit more damage back to him. As you can see, that does about 40-45%. And with the Leftovers, I'm not going to be 3 a would So, or I'm not going to be um, 2 a would at all, as you can see. So, what I'm going to do here is just go for my Stealth Rocks. I'm also not that afraid of this thing because my Haunter will be able to outspeed it and knock it out with the Shadow Ball. I am Choice Scarf Haunter, which does outspeed uh, Golurk at plus two, even if he's jolly max speed, which is really nice. So again, I'm perfectly willing to just ignore the threat in front of me and just set up my Stealth Rocks here. And uh, yeah, I, I think I said I'm not 2 would I'm not 3 would I'm 4 would which is really, really nice. Sandaconda is so bulky, um, and I really don't mind letting it go down at this point. Uh, it did its job pretty well. You know, it's going to get a nice amount of damage off onto his only Bolt Beak immunity. And as you can see, 
This Earthquake is just going to miss out on the KO, but he does die to rocks at this point, so there's no point in him switching out. And also his, um, his Bolt Beak immunity is uh, now dead. And like I said, I can go out into my Haunter to revenge kill this afterwards. So Santa Conda did a really nice job here. I was debating going out into my Haunter on the Earthquake here, but I didn't want to risk him potentially going for an Ice Punch or a Shadow Punch. Just because Haunter is still really valuable this game. Shadow Ball is unresisted by everything. If he is not Choice Scarf, Kirim, and I doubt he would be Choice Scarf on Kabalion, then my Haunter will guaranteed outspeed everything. At worst, I'd speed tie with the Kirim, so I can potentially outspeed it and knock it out with Shadow Ball at some point or Sludge Wave at some point, uh, which is really nice for me. So I'm gonna let that. Um, I'm gonna let my uh, my Santa Conda go down. I could have gone into Himanshan and knock it out with Bullet Punch from this range. But, uh, I just, again, I just decided to go out in a Haunter. Not really all that big a deal. Uh, even though, you know, I'll reveal that I'm Choice Scarf. Him knowing that I'm Choice Scarf really doesn't help him all that much. Like, again, it just does a lot of damage to his team. Shadow Ball's a great move versus his team. I don't mind him knowing that I'm Scarf. So, as you can see here, Haunter comes out, just knocks him out with the Shadow Ball. And it's gonna pick up a kill. Totally fine with these sequence of events. We both trade one Pokemon, and I get rocks up on his side of the field. And I eliminate the Bolt Beak switch in on his side of the field, which is fantastic. Um, so at this point, he has a few different plays he can make. He can go out into Vikeville, potentially go up, get up webs. He can go out into his Cabalion and hit me with an Iron Head, and, or potentially get up rocks. Uh, but the play he's ultimately going to make here is to go out into Kiram, which I think was his best play. Um... I don't know. Obviously, from this perspective, we can see what set he is, but from my perspective playing the game, I don't know what he is yet. If he is Specs, or at least decently offensive, he's going to be able to knock out my Haunter pretty easily. Um, I do have a, an Assault Vest Hitmonchan that is meant to take this thing on. If he's physical, a bit more of a problem, but unless he goes for like a Life Orb Outrage here, he shouldn't be able to knock out my Hitmonchan. So I'm going to go right into my Hitmonchan. I do have the Stab Drain Punch to be able to do a ton of damage to him, plus I have Mock Punch to get a nice little chunk off of his HP if he does decide to stay in and attack me for whatever reason. But as you can see, he actually reveals the Toxic. Good plan, his Fart expecting me to switch out of my Haunter. However, Hitmonchan is also something that he has kind of limited switch-ins to. He could go out into the Vikavolt if he wanted to. Um... But as you're going to see, he actually just ends up going right out into the Venusaur. Which is going to take this Drain Punch not too, too well. You know, it's not going to do a ton of damage, but for a resisted hit onto a relatively bulky Pokemon, that's kind of nice. And I do have the Ice Punch, which will be able to do a nice chunk of damage to him. And as you can see, he is um, he's actually a pretty bulky Venusaur, meaning that there's a chance that my Hitmonchan is going to be able to outspeed him because of the speed investment that I put on him. And as you can see, that does end up being the case. I'm going to be able to go for a nice punch. It almost knocks out the Venusaur, but we are going to easily be able to 2 KO him. Even with his own Black Sludge and Leech Seed recovery, he will be in range of Ice Punch on the following turn. And again, my game plan is going really well at this point because uh, this Venusaur, even if he does decide to switch out and save it, is now guaranteed in range of my Bolt Beak. Because Hitmonchan outsped this thing, I know that my Dracozolt's also going to be able to outspeed this thing. So overall, I'm in a pretty good spot. I got rid of two, um, I essentially have gotten rid of two of his best uh, Dracozolt switch-ins. So as you're going to see here, I think he just ends up clicking Sludge Bomb and he's going to let this, um, he's going to let this Venusaur go. Ice Punch is going to come in and knock it out. By the way, if you're wondering why his uh, Venusaur looks like it got the worst sunburn of its life, uh, because of the because we're doing land mode, you can kind of like pack stuff in or whatever. So uh, he just changed the he does a lot of recolorings of various Pokemon on streams and whatnot. Like the the Vikavolt he has here is the color of the Minnesota Vikavolt, which is a drive scheme. So it doesn't impact impact gameplay whatsoever, and it's only viewable from his perspective. So it's totally fine. It looks really it looks really cool. It's a nice little thing he did. Uh, but regardless, his Vikavolt is in. He has a few different plays he can make. Um, but my Gigalith is still at full HP and is max Spadef AV, and I doubt he'd be going for the Energy Ball here. So I'm totally fine with just going out into it on whatever he wants to do. He is going to set up the Sticky Web, which is a little problematic, but it's not the worst thing in the world. I say it's a little problematic because now Reboot is outslowed, or is um, outsped by his Kiram and Charizard. 
and potentially and more than likely his Cabalion. Um, however, it's not the biggest deal in the world because my Dracozolt in the sand still outspeeds everything that he has. Which is really nice, and obviously Haunter still outspeeds everything because it is not affected by, by uh, Sticky Web. And then Gigalith doesn't carry because Gigalith is the slowest thing on the planet. So I'll just go for Stone Edge there, get a ton of damage onto his Vikavolt. As you can see now, his last good Bolt Beak switch in, or his last good Dracozolt switch in, is now getting severely whittled away, and uh, we're going to be able to knock him out with the Rock Tomb uh, the following turn. Except we were able to land our Stone Edge and then miss our Rock Tomb, which is hilarious. Um, <laughs> as you can see, we're going to take a little bit more chip, but it doesn't really all matter all that much because, in case you didn't notice because I didn't point it out, Thunderbolt from this thing to max the def AV Gigalith does uh, two. <laughs> like that, you know, three Thunderbolts does not do 50% to this Gigalith, which is ridiculous. I know he wasn't that offensive on his, um, on his Vikavolt, but that still is just absolutely insane. Like, Gigalith is just a monster. Um, regardless, he's gonna send in his Cabalion, which kind of looks like, I'm not experienced in Mario, but you know that ball in Super Mario 1 that's, like, kind of green, and then you throw it, and then it bounces around, and when it hits something, or if it goes off screen, then you can throw another one? It kind of, Cabalion kind of looks like that, except in the shape of a Cabalion. You know, just, just something I, I noticed. Uh, anyway, I go into Reboot here because I don't want him setting up too much. Like, if he has the potential to set up, I will want him to be very limited in what he can do. I want him to either be able... I only want him to go for one thing, whether it be a Magnet Rise, a Rock Polish, or a Sword Dance. I don't want him being Double Dance and being able to get off both of his dances. So I'm just going to go into my Reboot here. If he knocks me out with the Close Combat, so be it. Obviously, he had Sacred Sword, but I'm assuming Close Combat on my end. Um... And I'm fine with my Reboot going down. I'd be able to go out into my Haunter on the following turn and then just click Shadow Ball. Or I can go out into my Hitmonchan and click Mock Punch. Either of which are very good plays. Uh, but as you can see here, he's actually running very little speed on his Cabalion. Because my Scarf Reboot under Webs is able to outspeed him. Which really surprised me. Uh, I he Again, he ran very, very little speed on this. It makes sense to be running bulkier so that he can take on my Dracos a little, a little bit better. But... Uh, he didn't even attack me, so I now have a relatively healthy reboot with a, an opposing team that doesn't really switch into Flare Blitz all that well. Uh, Charizard resists, but it'll still get 2 would with the rocks up. Uh, Kirim can come in, come in if it wants to, but that's still taking a ton of damage, and if he's not Roost, then he's in range of my Dracozolt 100% of the time. So this is a really nice situation for me, um, because, once, um, because now the Cabalion is guaranteed in range of my Bolt Beak, which is excellent. Uh, and again, with the stand up, my uh, Bolt Beak Mon will outspeed the entirety of his team until Charizard sets up an airstream, which hopefully I can prevent him from doing. Uh, I go for Flare Blitz here under the Kirim. I get the burn, which is kind of unfortunate. I don't know how much it mattered in the grand scheme of things, but um, if he's able to keep this Kirim at a very high percentage, like above, like around 90 and above, then he might be able to keep himself out of range of Dragon Claw from my Dracozolt, but because obviously he's unable to right now. Or obviously, because of the burn, that might be a little bit more difficult to do. Uh, also, we did this calc afterwards. Adamant Life Orb, Dragon Claw from Dracozolt does a minimum of 87% to this Kirin set. So, even though I do have Sand as well to potentially chip him away into that range, the burn is going to make that a lot easier. So, I, uh, even though it, you know, I probably would have been able to keep him low enough for Dragon Claw, the burn just makes it that much easier. So... I Flare Blitzed again as he Roosted again, as he Roosted, rather. I'm doing a little bit more damage to him than he's able to recover because of the burn, but because I'm taking so much Flare Blitz recoil, I'm going to end up losing my Reboot if I click one or two more Flare Blitzes. And again, my Dracozolt sweeps his team at this point, so what I'm going to do here is just go into my Gigalith, and then to maximize the number of Sand Turns that I get out of this, I'm just going to go right out into my Reboot and sack it off. I do live the Earth Power from this range, I guarantee, like Gigalith, as you saw earlier with the Vikavolt, uh, is insanely bulky with the Assault Vest, but I'll be able to live whatever he wants to do. However, again, I want to maximize my number of Sand Turns because I'm not Smooth Rock, so I'm just going to go right back out into my Reboot and sack it off. If he Roosts, I can click Low Kick, which will do more than Flare Blitz because it'll end up being Stab and it'll be base 120, uh, and it'll do a ton of damage. Um, and if he just clicks the Earth Power here, hoping to try and knock out my Gigalith, 
then he's going to be at 76% because of the burn plus the sand, meaning that he will always be in range of my Dracozolt. So, as you can see here, go right out into my reboot. No matter what he does, this is a fantastic play for me. Um, I realized I said I'd be able to go for low kick. Obviously, he uh, outspeeds me under the webs, which I forgot about uh, a couple seconds ago. But regardless, he if he roosted there, he still would have been at 87%, and he still would have been able to... Um, you know, I still would have been in a very good spot. So, as you can see here, um, I'm thinking a little bit about what I want to do. And, uh, here, where is it? There it is. The game, my computer explodes. Sorry, Kelly. Sorry, everybody watching who wanted a, you know, concrete ending to this game. However, um, Kelly said it pretty much immediately. Dragazolt destroyed the rest of his team. You know, there was maybe some potential for him to play around with going Cabalion on the Dragon Claw or whatever else, and then, you know, back into Kirim on the Bolt Beak, but ultimately, I had too many Sand Turns left. My Sand Setter was still alive. I had a Scarf Haunter. I had a Hitmonchan with priority. There was no way he was going to be able to pull this back, or there's at least very, very little way that he was going to pull this back, and Kelly agreed to a 4-0 defeat in my favor, so I win 4-0. Dracozolt picked up the last three kills in this game, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's how the game ends. Again, I do apologize for everybody watching that this is kind of in a really weird format, and I do apologize that the game ends in this weird way, but my footage got corrupted, and there is no versus recorder in this game, so there's no way for me to go back and do a regular postcom. Unfortunately, uh, Pokemon forces you to do live com or nothing, and if your footage gets corrupted, you just got to work with what you got. So, uh, we win 4 0 over Kelly. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you all enjoyed. Like I said, definitely check out his YouTube channel in the description below if you want to see the live commentary of this game. And I'll see you next time. Bye.